Okay, good evening everyone, and thanks for joining us for PETA's January Town Hall meeting. I'm Lisa Land, PETA's Senior Vice President of Communications, and I'll be co-hosting today's conversation along with Executive Vice President Tracy Ryman and VP of Marketing Joel Bartlett. You can follow us along on your computer and view images of the work we're discussing by visiting PETA.org slash January Town Hall in your web browser. And that's all one word, PETA.org slash January Town Hall. From there, you can hang up and listen directly through your computer. Tonight, you'll get the inside scoop on a few of the many wonderful victories we've achieved together just during the last year and learn how our progress is creating a kinder world for all animals. In addition to sharing our latest victories, we'll also be giving you a chance to win a free signed copy of PETA President Ingrid Newkirk's new book, Animal Kind. You may have seen, we hope you saw, that fantastic interview uh, with Ingrid about the book on Real Time with Bill Maher last weekend. And you can watch it on your website right now if you didn't catch it. Uh, or read the rave reviews of Animal Kind in places like the New York Times Book Review. The book is an, an inspiring look into animals' compassion and intelligence. From elephant funerals to mouse love songs to puffer fish art, which humans often overlook. The book also comes with a comprehensive guide to growing more compassionate in your kitchen, wardrobe choices, and everyday life. So please listen closely for your name near the end of the meeting to see if you've won a signed copy. The more books that are sold, for example, on Amazon Smile, the more websites like that will want uh, to carry animal rights content. So its success is super important to us. Help us get there. Order a copy of Animal Kind on Animal Smile. Order a copy for a friend. Listen to it on Audible and leave positive reviews whenever and wherever you can. And thank you so much for doing that. Today's town hall is taking place during the final hours of PETA's January membership drive, and the animals need you on their side. If you haven't yet renewed or joined for 2020, please do it this evening by pressing 7 on your phone at any time during today's conversation. If you're joining us online, you can visit PETA.org slash renew and give that way too. If you have a question about any of the work that Joel, Tracy, and I are discussing tonight, please press zero on your phone to ask it. And a PETA rep will write it down and drop you right back into the call where you'll have a chance to ask it live a little later tonight. For those joining us online, you can also type a question right into the bar at the bottom of your screen. Okay, I think most of our attendees are here. So I will kick off our discussion with PETA Executive Vice President Tracy Ryman and PETA Vice President of Marketing Joel Bartlett. Please remember to press 7 to support this work and press 0 to ask a question at any time during tonight's town hall. And stay with us after as we take questions and for your chance to win a signed copy of Ingrid's new book, Animal Kind. Now here's Joel to tell you how PETA's powerhouse marketing and social media teams are making animal rights the movement of the new decade and tackling speciesism in all its forms. Joel? Thank you, Lisa. PETA continues to be the most engaged with advocacy organization on social media, and not just among animal groups. Our posts and videos dominate Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Last year, we racked up half a billion video views. Just imagine what we can accomplish if every one of those viewers we're reaching takes action or even makes a positive change for animals. We're always doing whatever we can to show the misery that animals endure in abusive industries, but showing images of abuse isn't enough to stop it. In everything we do, we're showing the individual behind the suffering, the animal who needs our help and our respect. We don't censor anything, and when you combine that with PETA's unique brand of creativity, it's no surprise that many of our posts go viral for days or weeks on end. Sometimes people are still talking about that thing PETA did a year or years later, like that tweet that we're affectionately calling Idiomgate. I'm sure you all know that words have power, and an important step towards getting people to see animals as sensitive individuals 
with rights of their own is to stop the use of archaic phrases that imply animals are things to be exploited, abused, or killed. It's why we've long opposed the use of words like pet, which demean the animals who are part of our families. We're always fostering a more compassionate, modern mindset, and that's why we tweeted some common idioms that reflect animal abuse and suggested animal-friendly replacements for them. So instead of saying, kill two birds with one stone, we said, feed two birds with one scone. With one tweet, we basically broke the internet and made headlines around the globe, spawned scores of parody memes, and it was talked about by late-night hosts Seth Meyers and Stephen Colbert. Our tweet won a Shorty Award, too, which is the most prestigious social media award there is. But the best thing about this tweet going viral was that it introduced the term speciesism to millions who had never heard it before, and it got people talking. In comment boxes and heartfelt posts, people were openly discussing how animals are feeling intelligent individuals and sharing ideas on how to help them. And that discussion went on for months. And today, we've launched a revolutionary new end speciesism campaign designed to help break down the toxic, dangerous belief in human supremacy. We're shining a light on the arbitrary distinctions that humans often draw between ourselves and other animal species. We all know someone who wouldn't give a thought to eating the dismembered remains of a pig while condemning cultures that consume dogs or horses, for example. And I'm sure many who are worried about the coronavirus that started in a Chinese exotic meat market might think nothing of the salmonella or E. coli that can likely be found in their local butcher shop. So one of the ways we really ramped up the push against speciesism in 2019 was through our eye-opening dog barbecue demos around the world. So before you panic, of course, we did not grill real dogs. They were props. But many pedestrians who stopped to take a closer look went away with the realization that if they wouldn't eat a dog, they shouldn't eat a pig or a lamb or a cow or a crab or any animal at all. We placed dozens of I'm me not meat billboards featuring beautiful animals near the restaurants, slaughterhouses, and smokehouses that process and sell their flesh so that consumers will begin to recognize animals as the individuals they are rather than just a part of their next meal. Later this year, we'll be launching a big new youth-focused and speciesism push to help negate some of the dangerous beliefs about animals about animals that children are taught at an early age and grow the next generation of animal advocates. And some of our longtime celebrity supporters have eagerly joined the End Speciesism campaign too. You may remember when we released an eye-opening video from Riza from Wu-Tang Clan where the rap legend pointed out that humans and other animals aren't different in any important way. Now we've launched some great new We Are All Animals ads featuring influential people like Joker star Joaquin Phoenix, a lifelong vegan who we named Person of the Year for 2019. Joaquin rang in the new year on a PETA billboard in Times Square, and already this year he helped secure another big win for animals by making first the Golden Globes, and then the SAG Awards, the Critics' Choice Awards, the Oscar luncheons, and other award shows go vegan. Thank you, Joel. The Golden Globes going vegan and PETA handing out vegan swag to attendees at other shows like the Grammys and the Latin Grammys is another great reminder of how far we've come in our 40 years. Many of our staffers are too young to remember what it was like in the 1980s when PETA began, but at that time it was almost inconceivable that someday everyone who's anyone would be quote-unquote whole life vegan from shoes to shampoo and eating to entertainment. Back in 1980, our Beauty Without Bunnies database, which helps consumers find personal care products uh, that no animal suffered for, had about three pretty obscure brands on it. Today, we're welcoming giants like Dove, Dermablend, Herbal Essence, and Aussie. We even added Avon Products Incorporated to our Working for Regulatory Change list last year after years of work and pressure from PETA scientists. Now you can get vegan meat at almost every major fast food chain, which Tracy will tell you more about a little later. And everyone from Chanel to the Queen of England is going fur free. Even what we watch in movies and on TV is changing for the better. People are contacting PETA right away when they see live animals 
forced to act in these movies and TV shows because now we're all accustomed to beautiful CGI, which is computer-generated imagery, animals. We still have lots of work to do, of course, but the world is getting kinder every day. If you're curious about how you can do more to promote kindness every day, definitely check out Animal Kind for some inspiring ideas from Ingrid. You can also press zero to ask a question live later tonight. And we hope to hear from many of you making generous, much appreciated membership gifts by pressing seven or visiting PETA.org slash renew. Now I'd like to bring in someone who's familiar to many of our longtime town hall listeners, PETA Executive Vice President and woman of many hats, Tracy Ryman. Mm-hmm. I, I know many of you joining us tonight will remember that late in 2018, PETA rearranged our motto to put our, our trail brazen, blazing, excuse me, work against animal testing first and foremost in the minds of the pl- public and the experimenters themselves. And we sure kept that bol- ball rolling in 2019. Tracy, welcome, and can you share with folks some of the details? Certainly, and hello, everyone. Uh, Our expert scientists are working to strike out animal experiments in every category, from cosmetics and cleaners to food and flavorings. If you've been following our successes in the last 12 months, you probably know that we're leading the charge toward ending the near drowning of panicked animals in depression experiments. For decades, experimenters have been conducting a truly hideous experiment called the forced swim test. They claimed that the longer a rat, mouse, hamster, or other tiny animal struggles to stay afloat after they've been dropped into a beaker of water, the better an antidepressant drug will work for humans. It sounds like nonsense, and it is. PETA scientists and other experts have debunked the flawed science behind the forced swim test, and they're working to stop the terror of thousands of animals who endure it. As a result, government agencies, global corporations, universities, and journals like Nature are taking note. Just this month, uh, King's College in London became the first known academic institution to admit that it subjected animals to the forced swim test and to ban it. PETA Australia is also working hard to get Victoria University to follow suit. The impact of this campaign is being felt most strongly in the laboratories of pharmaceutical companies like Bristol-Myers Squibb, Pfizer, Bayer, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, AbbVie, and others, because all of those household names have banned the forced swim test after hearing from PETA and our committed members. We mentioned in October how our dancing crap stick was following Pfizer representatives everywhere they went, and that pressure paid off with Pfizer's commitment last month. And it was only a few weeks ago after PETA submitted a shareholder resolution and held many powerful demonstrations with a PETA supporter in a mouse suit pretending to drown that Bristol-Myers Squibb joined the list. Eli Lilly is one of the biggest companies still holding out on banning the forced swim test, and I'm sure it won't be much longer till they join the list, too. So we're keeping pressure on the National Institute of Mental Health to stop waffling about the forced swim test, which its director himself has admitted is bogus, and ban it. And the other tests that conduct that they conduct by hanging mice by their tails or electric shocking them which won't do a thing to help us understand human mental health disorders. So today, there's major discussion in the scientific community about ending the forced swim test completely, and it simply couldn't have been done without PETA. Our scientists and, of course, our generous supporters are doing more to stop the test than anyone ever has. So thank you to everyone who's been taking action online, sharing it on social media, attending our demonstrations, and more. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. And thanks to Lauren in Staten Island for your generous $10 donation. And same with Ruth in Oklahoma. Uh, $10 donation, it means the world to us. Marie in Sleepy Eye, Minnesota, for $100. This will really help forward our work. Shirley in Ontario, $20. Joanne in Visalia, California, $20. We can't thank you enough. We've also told you in the past about how we're giving indigestion to the food and beverage companies. You'll recognize their names. Those that are still testing on animals in order to make health claims about their ingredients. Well, in 2019 alone, we chalked up the names of dozens more companies ending these cruel animal tests. 
That ever-growing list includes one of Coca-Cola's biggest corn syrup suppliers, Ingridion, as well as Pernod Ricard, the parent company of Absolute Vodka, Seagram's Gin, and other major wine and spirits brands. It's true that for many vegans, uh, hummus is one of the essential food groups. So if you fall into that category, we have some great news for you from just a couple of weeks ago, actually. Sabra Hummus's parent company, Strauss Group, which is the second largest food and beverage corporation in Israel, told us that they've adopted a new policy banning all animal experiments. This means an end to deadly tests like the one where mice were starved, killed, and then dissected. So your favorite hummus and a growing list of products like wine and spirits and soda are now completely cruelty-free in addition to being vegan which is a great reminder to consider how your purchases are affecting animals of all species, whether that means making sure there's no milk or honey in your face cream, even if it wasn't tested on a rabbit, or picking a burger that's free of cow flesh and animal testing. Before we move on uh, from our work to bring science into the 21st century, I want to remind everyone of the historic victory we shared back in October. And that's the U.S. EPA's commitment, that's the Environmental Protection Agency's commitment to ending tests on mammals. This is extraordinary. It is the first time in history that a government agency, especially one that built its foundation on cruel, deadly, pointless animal experiments, has a concrete plan in place to protect animals, humans, and the environment by switching to more effective testing methods. That's non-animal testing methods. Pete has been working with the EPA for literally decades to take down their animal tests one by one. And this is a giant leap forward. The agency secretary even wore a pin he got at a PETA rally in D.C. with his mother when he was young. And he invited our own Dr. Amy Klippinger to sit next to him as he announced the groundbreaking plan. We sure have come a long, long way. I know that this victory is going to reverberate for years to come. And, of course, our affiliates are working to stop animal tests in their country's governments, too, from the U.K. to India and even China. PETA has more scientists on staff than any other animal organization in the world. And over the decades, we've been behind the biggest and most important victories to get animals out, completely out of laboratory cages, and to make exciting, human-relevant technology the norm. But as you can well imagine, this work takes quite a bit of money and resources. And the best way to help keep uh, help us keep ending animal tests for cosmetics and food and drink, new drug therapies, and really anything at all is by, please, renewing your membership tonight. You can press 7, and please give as generously as you can and help us make 2020 another terrific year for rats and mice and dogs and other animals. Remember, too, that you can press zero anytime tonight or type a question at the bottom of your webinar screen for a chance to ask a question live later this evening. We always, we always receive quite a few questions about how we're modernizing research and veganizing literally everything, so make sure you get your question in early. We hope you'll also stay with us for your chance to win a signed free copy of Ingrid's Animal Kind at the end of the call tonight. Or hop on over to Amazon Smile to order the book, uh, or do both. Uh, And please always leave a review uh, as you're listening. Now that you've heard how PETA scientists are helping the EPA and other agencies write cruelty out of their regulations, I'd like to turn it back over to Tracy for a recap of the other ways we helped change the law for animals in 2019. Tracy? Thank you, Lisa, and thanks to everyone who's pressing 7 to renew their membership or sending in such thoughtful questions. Uh, 2020 is going to be a huge year for animals in California because not only is the state's Cruelty-Free Cosmetics Act taking effect, but last year Governor Gavin Newsom signed a whopping four PETA-backed animal welfare bills into law. It's a testament to how much uh, we're changing hearts and minds that four bills were even on the docket at the same time, let alone so widely supported and passed. So here's the breakdown on the terrific changes ahead. PETA and our friends at Social Compassion and Legislation 
helped with the research and writing of California's Circus Cruelty Prevention Act, which bans the use of most animals in circuses. It's similar to prior laws we supported in New York, New Jersey, Illinois, and and Hawaii, and it's making a huge difference for elephants, big cats, and other animals who won't be dragged around and forced to perform confusing tricks anymore. Then there are the new laws that will stop the killing and skinning of exotic animals for bags, watch bands, and clothing. We enlisted our supporters to send thousands of emails and keep the pressure on officials until they upheld California's ban on alligator and crocodile skin and banned the sale of skins and other body parts from hippos, caimans, and certain other lizards. This is a huge win for the often overlooked animals who suffer in the exotic skins trade. And PETA was behind the scenes every step of the way to raise awareness of their suffering and inspire lawmakers to end it. The other massive victory for animals in California is the statewide ban on the sale and manufacture of new fur items. It's literally a life-saving measure that will prevent animals from being beaten, from being electrocuted and skinned alive for cruel, outdated, environmentally toxic items. We've been saying it for years, fur is dead, and California's law digs a grave a lot deeper. So while winter shopping season was in full swing, we also released footage from a PETA Asia investigation of fur farms in Russia, one of the world's biggest fur producers. We've talked before about the cruelty on Chinese fur farms and Russia is no different. Workers at these facilities were seen decapitating rabbits, breaking the necks of chinchillas and keeping panicked foxes confined to filthy cramped cages. These farms are believed to have ties to to some of the biggest fur auction houses. Every time we reveal cruelty like this, we're galvanizing the public and the fashion industry to evolve. And while this new case shows that we still have work to do to save rabbits and other animals, we also made huge strides for animals in the skins industry in 2019. We blew the lid off of the cashmere industry in China and Mongolia, showing people that goats scream in agony and terror while workers yank out their hair and hit them with hammers and blood-sloped slaughterhouses. And while that case was making headlines, we secured commitments from retail giants like H&M, ASOS, and Sundance to stop selling cashmere. I know this crucial material, will, this, this cruel material, will soon become a fading memory like Angora and Mohair are now, thanks to PETA. Also in 2019, luxury Italian clothing brand Jill Sander joined Chanel, Victoria Beckham, and others in banning exotic animal skins. Prada went fur free, whoever would have believed that, and we increased the pressure even more on Canada Goose to stop stuffing its coats with fur, uh, goose feathers and trimming the, their coats with coyote fur. And after literally decades of PETA pressure and demonstrations at Thanksgiving Day parades and outside its stores, we secured a monumental win as Macy's agreed to finally ditch the fur, too. That includes Bloomingdale's and all its private brands. So now we are pushing Nordstrom to make that same commitment, especially given the gruesome findings of the Russia Fur Farm Expose. Thanks, Tracy. Of course, we can't talk about California without talking about horse racing. It's been really horrific to see dozens of horses die at Santa Anita Racetrack in Los Angeles in just a matter of months, and more are dying almost every week. But please know that we at PETA are on it. The horse racing industry knows we're a force to be reckoned with and that PETA is determined to stop the carnage at Santa Anita and other racetracks in the U.S. We're keeping the misery of these horses in the headlines and in the minds of prosecutors and legislators like never before. Through our persistence, last year officials at Santa Anita agreed to our recommendations and implemented the most significant reforms in the history of the sport. These uh, reforms include banning secretive and suspect shockwave therapy and joint injections, increasing inspections, and banning whipping and more than a dozen drugs. But know that so long as horses are dying, it's not enough. PETA, to be clear, is opposed to exploiting all animals for entertainment. 
right now, at the very least, we are demanding that every track implement those regulations, improve the safety of their racing surfaces, hold trainers and veterinarians accountable, and stop horses from dying or suspend racing permanently. Tracy? Yeah, PETA is not just making waves for horses in the U.S., some of our supporters might remember that it was PETA, a PETA investigation that led to horse slaughter being banned in the United States, but it's still shamefully legal in other countries like South Korea, where horse racing and breeding is a multi-billion dollar industry. So last year, PETA Asia blew the lid off of South Korea's largest horse slaughterhouse and some of the farms that supplied horses for racing and for their flesh. Horses were hit in the head and faces. They were dirty and terrified and undernourished, and many could do nothing but watch as their companions were struck and killed right in front of them. As you might imagine, this case made waves around the world, and it stayed in the headlines for months. Thousands of people joined us in demanding that the Korean Racing Authority implement a retirement plan immediately, like the thoroughbred aftercare alliance that PETA helped put in place here in the U.S. And today, more and more people are seeing the connection between racing and slaughter and opposing the abuse of horse racing across the board. We also saw more progress related to this expose just a couple of weeks ago. For the first time ever, the South Korea slaughterhouse and two of its employees were fined millions of South Korean won for killing horses in full view of other horses. But we want more people to be charged for the beatings and other abuses caught on camera. And hopefully, we'll have more updates for you and more progress to stop thoroughbred deaths to report in the months ahead. Thanks, Tracy. We've mentioned before how PETA Asia investigations are breaking new ground for animal rights in some of the grisliest industries, whether it's uncovering the painful plucking of rabbits for Angora, exposing gruesome slaughterhouses in Thailand and Cambodia, or convincing big travel companies to stop promoting the world's worst zoos and aquariums. And we told you last year, PETA Asia's expose of the King's Cup Elephant Polo Tournament. That led to the demise of that awful sport throughout Thailand, throughout Thailand. They're determined to stop elephant sports in Nepal now, too, after releasing horrifying footage of beatings and abuse at the Chitwan Elephant, elephant Festival for the second year in a row. And we will win that. PETA and our affiliates have been behind some of the world's biggest victories for elephants, and I'm confident that the 2020s are going to be the decade when we get them all free from the chains. Absolutely. Uh, in 2019, we stopped malls and arenas across the U.S. from hosting circuses. We pushed venues to stop some of the cruelest circus outfits from performing with elephants. And we finally saw Nosy the Elephant's ex abusive exhibitor lose his license. Big names like Voters Travel, TripAdvisor, and Booking.com stopped promoting elephant rides, and world-famous Buddhist temple Angkor Wat in Cambodia announced it would stop offering them. And it's not just elephants we're helping. One of PETA's most well-known campaigns, of course, is our call for SeaWorld to empty the tanks. And in 2019 alone, we convinced TripAdvisor and Booking.com as well as AAA North, Northeast, United Airlines, Virgin Holidays, and others to stop selling SeaWorld tickets. As well, we released a high-profile veterinary report condemning SeaWorld trainers' use of dolphins as surfboards and launch pads in their cruel shows, uh, leading to even greater public pressure for the park to stop exploiting all animals. SeaWorld may be stuck in the past, but I love working with companies like TripAdvisor who get it particularly when they're so well-known that they set the trend for their competitors. So we were also thrilled this year when, after we worked closely with them behind the scenes, hospitality giant Airbnb announced sweeping new animal welfare guidelines and even donated $100,000 to PETA to support our campaign against captivity. One area where some people just don't seem to get it, though, is the Iditarod. I even met with the CEO last fall, and he's refusing to make changes for dogs or to honor the public's call for a kinder, modern event with willing human athletes. PETA is leading the charge to show people that the Iditarod isn't fun or adventurous, 
It's deadly and just plain cruel. We kicked that work up a notch in 2019 with a first-of-its-kind investigation of Iditarod Musher's kennels, where dogs were emaciated, chained outside, and shivering in the Alaska winter, and forced to race despite illness or injuries. Even former race-winning dogs were denied crucial veterinary care when they needed it most, and their food was nothing more than rotten slop. Our investigator helped rescue one sweet, beautiful dog named Maggie from this torment. And I'm so happy to report that she just got to spend her very first Christmas in a loving indoor home. We want all the dogs to have a future like Maggie's. And that's why we're keeping the pressure on sponsors like Chrysler and Alaska Airlines to stop funneling money into the Iditarod, where even race organizers call dog deaths a, quote, unpreventable hazard. We've already pushed Coca-Cola, State Farm, Jack Daniels, and other big companies to see the light, and we want to do everything we can to make this year's Iditarod the very last. Thanks, Tracy, and we will get there, and that'll be because of the generous donations we're getting tonight. Thank you to everyone who's supporting our work to help dogs and other animals by pressing 7 by donating tonight, including Elena in Ontario. Thank you so much for your $50 donation. Maria in Los Angeles for your donation. Sarah in Gulfport, Mississippi, $20 was going to help us get there. Charles in New York City, $150. Thank you so much. Rita in Glendale, Arizona for your wonderful $50 donation. Pamela in Michigan, $1,000. Thank you so, so much. Julie in Ashland, Oregon, $500 tonight. I think everyone here knows that PETA's work is about more than just promoting vegan eating. It's about stopping cruelty to every individual animal who's suffering. It doesn't matter if they're a pig, a dog, an elephant, a rat, anyone. But that said, we're ecstatic to see the vegan revolution growing bigger than ever. And in many cases, it's that little extra nudge from PETA that compels a company to introduce more animal-friendly menu items. Tracy, I know you're excited about sharing some highlights from your team's work on these issues, so I'm going to hand it back over to you. Yes, thank you. Even before it began, 2019 was being heralded as the Year of the Vegan, and we made that title a reality in some very important ways. Early in the year, after hearing from thousands of frustrated PETA supporters, Chinese food chain Panda Express made some of its meals entirely vegan rather than using animal-based seasoning. Also, Baskin Robbins introduced fully vegan, super creamy ice cream flavors, which I've been eating way too much of. Uh, Even brands associated with the dairy and meat industries like Smithfield, Tyson, and Chobani are now turning their attention to vegan meats, yogurts, milks, and more. Because they know that the only way to keep up with the demand from, ca- from compassionate consumers is to provide these options. Vegan chicken, vegan cheese, crumbles, and burgers are available at, at restaurants everywhere you look. And PETA played a role behind the scenes in every single one of them. You can get a Beyond Burger at Denny's and Carl's Jr. or Hardee's, a Beyond Meatball Sub at some Subways, a Beyond Beef burger crumble at Del Taco. Meal delivery services like Blue Apron are now carrying Beyond Meat too. And one of my favorite social media videos from the year shows Ingrid ordering a vegan Beyond sausage breakfast sandwich at Dunkin' with a huge smile on her face and treating the customer behind her to one too. So please, everybody go get one and pay it forward. And we can't forget another wildly popular social media post highlighting the vegan revolution, our live stream from a KFC in Atlanta, Georgia. But unlike years past, we weren't there to protest KFC, which we used to call Kentucky Fried Cruelty, by the way. We were there to celebrate. If you're following us online right now, you can see what this store normally looks like, and here's what it looked like last August when KFC launched their finger-licking vegan chicken for one day only. The photo shows a line stretching all the way around the block. It took our live streamer an hour just to get into the parking lot. The vegan chicken sold out in five hours flat, and customers went crazy for it. That exciting launch represented 20 years of PETA's hard work coming to fruition, from eyewitness investigations of KFC chicken suppliers 
to scores of protests and pressure in the boardroom, all to get KFC to improve the treatment of chickens and to finally catch up with the demand for vegan options. One time, KFC executives were so anxious to get us off their backs that they took a corporate jet to our headquarters in Norfolk to meet with us. Ingrid brought them vegan fried chicken, but they were too afraid to try it. <laughs> Times have uh, definitely changed. So the whole fast food paradigm is shifting, and that really underscores why PETA is focusing on ending outdated belief systems. We don't need to beg people to try vegan fried chicken or order a veggie burger anymore because they already know how important, environmentally friendly, business savvy, and delicious it is. So we can push forward and focus on the core principles of animal rights. Thanks, Joel. I'll also uh, add that uh, today KFC announced that they have extended uh, their uh, Kentucky Fried Finger Lickin' Vegan Chicken to more restaurants. So we're really excited about that. Uh, I also want to add that PETA is always working to push the envelope and help people see the connections between animal rights and human rights and how discrimination and cruelty against certain groups often relates to the discrimination and cruelty towards other groups. One of our campaigns that really took off in 2019 was our wake-up call to Starbucks, with tons of people joining us and telling the coffee chain that its vegan milk sur surcharge sucks. It can cost customers up to 80 cents extra. And it isn't just cruel to cows, it's also unfair to people of color who are more likely to be lactose intolerant. Starbucks is still refusing to listen, and it's still charging its customers for ordering milk alternatives that are better for human health, for the animals, and the planet. So our staffers and activists all around the country are now occupying Starbucks while they work. And we also have visited the CEO's mansion in Seattle this month to show him that the surcharge for nut milk is what's really nuts. We just have a few more highlights to share with you before taking questions. So here's your latest reminder to, to submit questions about really anything you're wondering about. You'll be able to press 7 and donate uh, or give online until the end of the meeting. But don't wait on that either. We need your help to keep funding the wonderful work all of the wonderful work we're discussing tonight. Your generosity is what allows us to push for, for example, anti-tethering legislation in rural regions of Virginia and North Carolina where our field workers regularly meet and help dogs who can sometimes spend their whole lives in loneliness and misery at the end of chains. In some cases, we're able to get these special individuals surrendered to us and help them find good adoptive homes. But when that's not an option, PETA field workers do their best to help make them as comfortable as possible by regularly providing nutritious food, fresh water, affection that they've never felt before in their lives, and sturdy dog houses to protect them from the worst summer heat and the chilling, chilling winter cold. In 2019, we delivered nearly 300 of these dog houses. Our mobile clinics also spayed and neutered an incredible 12,000 plus dogs and cats at free or low cost to their guardians. This helps give them a happier and healthier life while keeping unwanted animals from enduring a harsh life on the streets or from being turned away by overburdened shelters. PETA also operates our own shelter of last resort, which means we never turn away any animal in need. And we can offer a peaceful release to animals who might otherwise face a prolonged and painful death. We recap the, the great work of PETA field workers at the end of each month and, of course, at the end of the year. And it's truly awe-inspiring to see how many dogs and cats and other animals they reach. PETA is also going further for companion animals of all species. We're providing tips for caring for birds and keeping them out of cramped cages and exposing the abuse that reptiles face in breeding mills and big box stores and showing everyone that fish are sensitive, complex animals just as worthy of our respect and consideration as the dogs and cats we share our homes with. You, you've probably seen our massive campaign against Petco and other retailers for treating beta fish like they're desk decorations or, or selling them as so-called starter pets. We released waves of powerful footage from stores across the country revealing that betta fish were, were languishing in mere inches 
of filthy water, and they, they were stacked on top of each other on shelves. Some dead fish were even left to rot. And we rounded up tons of social media posts and Yelp reviews showing that when caring shoppers approach store managers about this treatment, they do nothing to make life better for fish. And this is all after the fish end up in stores, if they even survive that long. Their misery starts long before that. PETA Asia recently released an unprecedented investigation of beta fish farms in Thailand, showing fish confined in tiny containers where the water barely covers their bodies. Workers who sorted them for shipping deliberately left them out of the water for long periods of time, and the bodies of dead betas were just discarded on the floor. Often before they're shipped to stores throughout Asia and the United States and around the world, the fish are starved or forced to drink water containing tranquilizers to keep them from eating their own tails during the stressful journey. Unfortunately, fish haven't historically gotten the recognition they deserve, but now even lifelong vegans and committed animal rights supporters who had no idea this was happening are telling us on social media that they'll never again buy fish or support the animal trade. And with help from PETA members across the country who are leading creative demonstrations at their local PECOs, we are more determined than ever to push the company to do better by betas and stop selling them. And I'm excited to let everyone know that in 2019, following a decade of PETA campaigning, we successfully persuaded Walmart to stop selling all live fish. So we hope PETCO and others won't be far behind. And just a final reminder from me that if you want to learn even more about how amazing fish are, don't hesitate to order and share Ingrid's book, Animal Kind. Thanks, Joel. And thanks to your whole team for helping everyone recognize that every animal of every species has a right to live free from cruelty and exploitation and abuse. There's no question that we'll face challenges in 2020. But with the help of everyone here tonight and all of our millions of other supporters, we're determined to celebrate our 40th anniversary with a bang and make this one of the best years yet for animal rights. Thank you for being with us, for pressing 7 to donate, and for taking the time to ask questions about our vital work. And now let's move on to those questions. Um, let's see. First one we have is from Eleanor in Boston. The question is, what victory for animals do you think PETA will most likely accomplish in 2020? That's a great question. Tracy, do you want to tackle that one? Sure. Um, okay, what victory for animals do we think will be most likely? Well, I have to say that every year we accomplish dozens and dozens of victories. Um, and so it's really difficult, I think, to pick just one. Um, so I think what I would say is that I think that we will convince more companies to stop the forced swim test. In fact, I think it's likely that we're going to stop the forced swim test entirely. Um, I think we will free more bears and other animals like tigers from hideous roadside zoos because we're working on a number of, of cases like that right now. Um, I, I'm very hopeful that we'll stop Canada Goose from selling coyote fur and goose feather jackets, but we do need your help to really continue to push them. Um, I think we'll convince more retailers to replace wool and leather with innovative non-animal materials in their designs. I think we'll see KFC with Kentucky fried big finger licking vegan chicken nationwide. Who can't wait for that? Um, I think we're going to create many more vegans, and the list goes on and on. That's very exciting. I'm very excited about 2020. <laughs> um, Me too. I think it's going to be good. <laughs> I think so too. And already, it's just we've gotten off to a great, great start. Absolutely. Um, all right. Let me see. Our next question comes from Janine in Montreal, and the question is, do you have any updates on the rescue work PETA is doing to help animals trapped by the eruption of that volcano in the Philippines? And, you know, if it's okay, I'll take this one. Um, it. We we on staff get uh, basically daily updates from our wonderful staff and volunteers, um, and we've been really overwhelmed by the outpouring of support from PETA members. Um, we were the first and on many days the only charity to reach the devastated island of Tall after the eruption. 
Um, we've rescued more than 130 animals. That's dogs and cats and horses, cows, pigs, chickens, herons. Um, and just so you know, too, they're going to the island every day. They're getting on when they can. But every day there is a threat of a new eruption. So these good folks are taking, are literally risking their lives. Um, but every time they go, they know they have a chance of bringing more animals back. Um, but also bear in mind that every single day they're doing food drops. So for the animals they can't take off the island, um, they're, you know, they're, they're seeing the animals, they're giving them affection, they're leaving food and water for them so that they don't go hungry, and they're going to stick with it until um, you know, every animal who needs help gets help. So thank you for asking that question, and thank you for your support on this. It's really important. Um, okay. The next question is about Dylan the bear. Yay. So the question is from John in Phoenix. And uh, the question is, where's Dylan the bear now? And when can we see video of him in his new home? And Joel, I think this is a good one for you. Oh, yes. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only one obsessed with Dylan's rescue story. Mm -hmm. uh, well, so for, for those of you who, who don't know Dylan's story, he is a morbidly obese uh, black bear with, with terrible arthritis who was just recently, actually, mon on Monday, was held, up until Monday, was held in a cramped cage at a sports club in Pennsylvania. So after months of intense campaigning for Dylan, including uh, ad blitzes, uh, a billboard, a letter from uh, our actor uh, Alec Baldwin, and the actions of nearly a 150,000 PETA supporters online. Uh, the club this past weekend just announced they would finally relinquish Dylan. And so now he's setting up at a spacious sanctuary in Colorado. And you can see the, the first video footage of, uh, of Dylan uh, getting used to his new home on our social media, um, where I hope everyone's following us, um, any of our social media accounts, and also on our website. Uh, and I cannot wait to see his transformation after he's finally had a chance to hibernate. Um, and so we will be definitely showing more photos and videos of Dylan as he has his wonderful transformation in his new life. So follow us to, to see more. And I also want to bring up another great rescue from uh, just last week, uh, Luna and Remington two tigers who were imprisoned and tormented at Dade, City's, uh, Dade City Wild Things in Miami are finally on their way to a sanctuary as well. And we will talk more about Dylan, Luna, and many other Peter rescues um, that the, our legal team is accomplishing in our town hall next month uh, in, or next uh, in March. Okay, our next question is live, and it's from Wendy in Oregon. Wendy, what is your question? Hi, my mom has always been on the fence about animal rights, but I managed to convince her to go vegan for Veganuary. Do you have any suggestions on how to get her more involved once the month is over? Tracy, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, well, first of all, just to to try and make sure that she stays vegan after January, Veganuary, as it's called. Um, I don't know if everybody knows, but we have this wonderful vegan mentor program. It's absolutely free, and we have a staffer who helps coordinate this, but we have over 100 uh, volunteer mentors around the country, people who are just really want to help other people go vegan and stay vegan and, and have a successful vegan experience. Um, so one of the things I would suggest is to hook her up with a vegan mentor, um, and you can just do that uh, on our website, and uh, it's a great way to just kind of give them the support that they need to make sure they stick with this. Um, but other things, um, you know, if you don't get PETA Global or if she doesn't get PETA Global Magazine, that's our magazine that you get when you become a member, that's a fantastic thing to give her. It's so It's always filled with, you know, uplifting victories and short bits of information that will educate her in a, in a positive way. It's a great way to really bring someone around who's a little bit skeptical or who, who is sympathetic but not quite on board. So I'd definitely do that. Of course, ordering Ingrid's book, Animal Kind. Um, it is so filled with interesting information about animals. I mean, it really takes like 
you know, fascination with animals to a whole new level. Um, I really enjoyed it and I learned things and I've worked at PETA for 28 years. So I've learned a lot more. And at the end of that book, it gives you all kinds of simple things you can do more difficult things too, but really simple things you can do to uh, help animals that don't require a great deal of work. Um, But mostly I would just remind her that, you know, small, small things matter. And so whatever she can do would be great. Oh, and one last thing too, um, if she's 50 or older, we have a website for this over 50 crowd um, called PETA Prime. It's PETAprime.com, and it's a great community with lots of tips and ideas and interesting things for, for people, and I think she might find some other folks there who are interested in similar things. So that's another great thing you can try and do to, to get her more involved. Thanks, Tracy. We're going to have to announce the book winners in just a minute, but we'll take one quick final question, and that comes to us from Gail in Salt Lake City. And her question is, what's the best way you suggest to convince a company to make their products vegan? I'd love to see more vegan options at my local coffee chain, and and I'm having no luck with managers. And I know, Joel, this is a constant in your life, so tell us what you're doing. (laughs) Yeah, so I... um, I this is yes, this is very uh, central to my being. I'm constantly harassing, friendly harassing, the manager of my coffee shop about being more vegan friendly too, especially to drop the vegan surcharge. And he actually told me last week that they're now 50/50 vegan milk to cow's milk. So there, there is real progress happening. But um, but I showed him the, the news from Starbucks saying that 21% of their carbon footprint comes uh, from dairy, and and I let him know that other uh, local chains like Pret a Manger and Maison Kaiser have dropped the the vegan surcharge. So part of it's like education, like you know, so recognizing he doesn't he didn't know those things. So it's like I was more tapped into these things. So being persistent, being uh, education, and knowing that uh, like I know that he's sensitive to the competition, which I, I think is is something that Pia has found in general with companies. Uh, and then I also I have found a lot of success with leaving Google reviews. So I when there's something that I like, I leave a Google review or you know encourage other people to leave Google reviews saying, you know, hey, I I don't like this. There's no vegan options. Um so leave positive the Google reviews and use leave uh critical ones. Um, and I, I again, I know that my coffee shop manager is really sensitive to that. He complains about Google reviews left, um, you know, people don't like the music and, you know, stuff like this. So that's a way to, um, you know, keep nudging them. In other words, Peter's motto, never be silent. It really works. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. So thanks again to everyone who submitted questions tonight. And we, if we miss getting to you, you know the story. A PETA team member will touch base with you with answers over the next few days. So don't worry, you will get answers to your questions. And we'll be signing off in just a minute or two after announcing the winners of our book giveaway. But I hope you'll stay on the line to leave a voice message sharing your thoughts about tonight's meeting and uh, letting us know how you plan to help animals even more this year. Whether it's sharing our vegan starter kits, hosting a book club to discuss animal kind, or other animal rights literature, or holding your own demonstration against the fur trade. Let us know. Now, drum roll. Here are the winners of the free signed copies of Animal Kind. First, Jamie. Congratulations. Jamie from Oregon City, Oregon. Amy in Hawkinson, Delaware. Congratulations. Andrea from Montreal. Uh, Congratulations. Charmaine from Norwalk, Connecticut. And Vonda from Ontario, California. Those are our five winners. Congratulations to you. Enjoy the book. We know you will. Um, Be sure to share it with friends and order more copies and all that good stuff. Um, We'll contact you soon to confirm where to send your book. And please remember that you can also order copies for yourself and everyone you know, and that's everyone you know on Amazon Smile. This is a really good book for people who are just being introduced to animal rights too. So don't think that it's only for people who, you know, already call themselves PETA members. Ingrid's traveling the country right now to promote and discuss her book, so please tune in uh, to her on TV, radio interviews, um, and please go to her book signing events and get the book today um, so you can learn more about animals who aren't just like us. They are us. We are all animals. And if you love animal kind as much as we clearly do, buy an extra copy for a friend. And then, again, I hate to repeat this, but it's very important, leave reviews often and everywhere. 
Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight and for your continued support on the work we do. We simply, uh, and I'm not just saying this clearly, we cannot do this work without you. So we appreciate each and every one of you. Good night, everyone, and we hope to have you join us in our next town hall in March.